Heavenly Father, dear precious God, we want to thank you for this moment we can come together in fellowship. Father, we want to praise you for the promises in your words. We want to praise you for what you've done for us this week. We want to thank you for all the blessings we received. We want to thank you for life, for health and strength. Father, we want to thank you for the opportunity to be here at the School of the Prophets, the, the center of the Three Angels' message worldwide, and it's a privilege to, to be here, Father, and it's a blessing. And we want to thank you for the week that's behind us. And we now enter into your Sabbath and into the Sabbath worship. We hope that our songs were accepted by you and Hopefully the angels were able to sing with us. Father, we pray that you continue to be with us as we enter into study. Be with us with your Holy Spirit, pour out your letter rain upon us as we are asked and promised in the, in the word that we should ask for the letter rain in time and letter rain. Father, pour it out upon us, open our minds and our understanding that we may understand these messages as we study Daniel, Daniel 8, Daniel 11, and we enter upon this, the, the finishing of this study as the department that will be soon. Father, be with us as we uh, study this and that we may come to a conclusion that will also reach our hearts and our understanding. Father, protect us with your holy angels that we are not disturbed by whatever. Be with those who are not here or they're still on their way. Please bring them soon so we can study with them too. Father, we thank you for this moment and we praise you. And we pray this all not because of our own name, but we ask this in Jesus Christ. Often when we look at the word daily in the book of Daniel, the five times that, it's come, that it comes up, three times in, verse, in chapter 8, once in Daniel 11 and once in chapter 12, we often think of the daily <coughs> as paganism. We're correct to do that. But what I've tried to show in our classes is that in each of those five verses we need to look at the history that's connected with them and they can teach us different truths so even though in a generic sense it talks about the daily being paganism in those varying verses the, 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 the different aspects that are being taught so as we come to verse 11 we want to try and understand the history connected with this taking away compared to the other verses that we've looked at. We've suggested that there are these five guidelines, that, six guidelines that are going to help us to get through this verse and to try and tackle all the points that we need to. We've looked at the gender, we've looked at the correct translation of the word by, whereas it should be from and not by. We've looked at that. And <coughs> I've just begun to mention now this word is min. Um, it has varying, various pronunciations, but I'm just going to give it the pronunciation of min. It's H4480. And we're going to see how this word is connected with this concept of the daily repeatedly in the sanctuary service or the sanctuary system. So we want to make sure that we get that correct. Uh, the word sacrifice was supplied by man's wisdom. That's Alan White's phraseology. William Miller, when he says this, he says that it was the only place that he could find this word daily in the whole Bible, he hadn't come across it before. 
So the first mention is in the book of Daniel, chapter 8, verse 11. Then we were looking at the grammar. So we, we've just about finished the, the, the discussion on grammar, but we just want to make sure that we're clear on, what, on how we're going to tackle the grammar. There are two rules in grammar. There's the grammatical nearness that we've discussed and the subject noun association. So grammatical nearness was dealing with if you have, just as you, this, you, just as you have in this sentence, this verse, you have two nouns. You have the little horn, he, and you have the prince of the host, Jesus. You have these two people. And then it says very soon afterwards, him. And that him is very close or adjacent to the prince of the host, Jesus. And so this rule of grammatical nearness would make you understand that the him is talking about Jesus. So you'd read the, uh, the verse, the little horn magnified himself against Jesus and from Jesus the daily is taken away and the place of Jesus' sanctuary is cast down. And then the other rule that we want to understand in grammar is the subject noun association. Here you're going to pick up the subject of the sentence and any pronouns that follow on that sentence, they're going to be attached to the subject. Subject of this sentence is clearly the little horn, the he. Yea, he. You go back into the verses, into verse 9, it tells you who that person is. And then using this association, the him, would be connected to the subject. But then we saw that when, the, when this verse was translated by the translators of the King James Bible, they t subtly twisted this verse around. And why did we suggest they did that? Why are they twisting this verse around? Because in the Hebrew, the Prince of the Host comes, is in the first part of the sentence. So that maybe we should just remind ourselves of that. In the Hebrew, it says, even to the Prince of the Host, he, or the little horn, magnifies himself. And then it would say, and from him, the day he was taken away and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. So the reason we want to understand that is because if we use both rules, grammatical nearness and subject noun association, we're going to get the same answer that the him and the his both belong to the little horn and it's no way connected with Jesus or the Prince of the Host. So why did we discuss that the King James, King James translators want to subtly twist this around. Why, the, why were they doing that? I guess a proper English sentence starts with the subject and then followed by the object. But in the Hebrew it's the other way around, right? It can be that, but you can get, you can get, you can get some nice English sentence, sentences yep. that are done correctly with the object in the, fir in the first. So maybe they wanted to tidy it up, but, but we, 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 we were looking at a more philosophical reason for that um, because they're reading something into this verse they're not translating that they're interpreting they're interpreting what this verse means based upon the context of chapter 8 and that's why they're making this switch because if the focus is on the sanctuary this, this chapter is about the sanctuary with the area they want to make the hymn Jesus mm -hmm. yes why why did they want to make him Jesus? Because the daily sacrifices. Because the daily sacrifice. Mm -hmm. they, they, that they put the word sacrifice in there because what do they want us to understand? It's daily ministration. Yeah, this is some kind of sacrificial system that's going on that they want to put the word sacrifice in it. And the reason they're doing that is because everywhere, you, virtually everywhere you see this word sacrifice, sorry, this word daily, when it's connected to the sanctuary service, you're going to have sacrifices associated with it. There's these sacrifices that are going to be associated with this word almost all the time. So they, they're reading into this daily because of the context of chapter 8 that this is something to do with a sacrifice that's happening daily. Plus, what do we read in verse 26? What is this division of? The morning and evening. What does the morning and evening remind you of? The morning and evening the sacrifice. sacrifice. Those two sacrifices have morning and evening. How often do they have that? Continually. So everything is driving you as a translator to think 
that you know what verse 11 is talking about yeah. and then what so they have to add it in and then they but because they added it they had to change this so now they're adding it in because what is Christ Christ is he came he died crucified he resurrected and what's he doing he's in heaven ministering on behalf because he's a high priest book of Hebrews tells us that tells us that very clearly so now they're switching from interpreting sorry from translating to interpreting now they're going to interpret this verse for us and they want to switch it all around to make it all neat and tidy because they want us to understand that the him and the his is Jesus so they're funneling our understanding in that direction and it wasn't good it, they did a bad job one of the most important verses for us to grapple with they made it so hard for us Sister. the history of them doing this by who's the them? Who are you yeah, think? I know because you're not identifying the them. So my brain is telling me is it? Well, no. I mean, my understanding is the pioneers knew what the daily was. It was later on with Conradi and Prescott. And them they changed, right? Like, are you talking about them? No, no, no. That's what I'm asking because you, your them and my them is different. Well, that's the them I'm thinking of. I know. <laughs> the them I'm thinking of is the King James translators Whoa. I think it's I think it's 70, 70 or 50, 50 or 70 men it wasn't 40 I heard it was 7, seven groups yeah. yeah it seven. was in groups of 7 so I can't remember it was it so 4 groups of 7 yeah. yeah to be sure groups, so it's it said the word of the Lord is purified 7 times mm -hmm. 7 is or was it 49 was it 7 times 7 it, there's some kind of nice little numbering it. system on that thing true. but it's, it's a fair few men I'm talking about those ones, the translators. Well, what era was that in? What year? It's 1611. This is a 1611 King James Bible. I mean, Daniel Prescott didn't do anything with the Bible. The King James Bible was already there for so, a couple of So years. people thought that Christ was ministering in the, the heavenly sanctuary long before it's these guys came along, the Adventist people. <laughs> Everybody's, everybody after AD 31 knows that Christ is in the, most, in the sanctuary in heaven. Yeah. All Christians well, know that. They, well, no, like, what the daily is, like, like we've learned... I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, you know, we could get into the... Okay. What, what I tend not to do is we could get into all the, all the spirit of prophecy quotes that go through the history of Conradi and tell us all how, how bad all these men are. And I'm not saying we shouldn't do that, but I'm just looking at this verse. What she's no, no. She's she's just, I'm not understanding what she's saying. She's saying that were the people who helped this sanctuary ministry view before Conradi and Co. Yeah, they, didn't invent, in they didn't invent that. Yeah, they didn't invent it. I thought they did. I don't, I don't know what's happening in 1611. I haven't got any 1611 commentaries. Okay. Conradi founded studying the meaning, he found it in old Protestant theology yeah. and oh, scripture. Okay. So this is, just, this is the issue. Yeah, they just picked it up, it wasn't new. I'm narrow, I just have an Adventist mind, I guess. <laughs> so do I. So do I. I have an Adventist mind as well, I think. I'm not, I'm not looking at okay. the historical... Right. His, the, the historical, historical story that goes behind this. I'm just saying <coughs> what the verse is, the problems with the verse, mm. and why, they, why, you, why when you translate it this way, you get, you, you're going to generate this, you're going to turn this verse into something that it shouldn't be it shouldn't be. Ellen White tells us that. Because when Ellen White says um, the word sacrifice was supplied, she's doing that. I, I don't know how old Conrad is, but uh, probably before he was even born. She's doing this in 1850, mm -hmm. and he may have just been born. I don't know how old Con Conrad he was when, in 1901, but he may not have even been 51. Mm -hmm. so, so this is long before Conrad this issue is. Um, I'm glad to have the clarification because all along I've been thinking of those people in Adventism because I, I really didn't know that the Protestant world taught that the mm -hmm. daily was Christ. Okay. Was I think we did mention this before in class because because when I was saying them, you yeah, said sorry. you said it was Colorado last time as well. Did I? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. okay, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. Um, I don't think I haven't read it in William Miller's works or any of the pioneers how they battle over this issue of the daily but their argument with it being paganism is in contradiction to the Protestant view in Millerite history again 
long before Conradi's on the scene, long before these men. 1856 he was born. 1856? Yeah. Mm. Wow, 1856. Okay. Um, so yeah, so Conradi's picking up this ancient uh, Protestant position. By the way, I don't know if you, you may, not, may or may not, Will, uh, no, Uriah Smith, in his book, in the appendix of um, Daniel and Revelation, he, he does this calculation where he gets 2520, you probably, I don't you may have seen it, 2520 and he says it goes four times and then he gets 10,080, he says 10,080 years is an awful long time and he kind of ridicules this whole idea. You, you, have you read that argument? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just before you say it, it was um, him, I'm pretty sure it was not him. If it's in one of the versions of this book, but uh, yeah, it's in the appendix, isn't it? Yeah. Exactly, and I took the time in Loma Linda University um, Library to check when it appeared the first time in the volumes that they have, and it was long after his death, so I'm pretty sure they edited it afterwards. He uh -huh. never commented on yeah, it. Yeah, that's true. There are versions where it's not... I know there's versions, that, but I, I hadn't yeah. taken the, the trouble to see if it will, the first time it was added in, whether he was still alive or not. Bring me lo all the yeah. books and all, and, 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 and then look when it appeared first. I don't remember the year, but it was like. But he did, 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 did he write it himself? Huh? I mean, he could write it himself, but the, the, the text of the, this appendix was a text from him. And that Probably not. Out. Probably not. I mean, they, they had lots of appendix things they put in the appendix later on. It appeared like many years after his death. I would. Yeah, There's no reason to see. But they can add it afterwards, but it's. From the only point I was trying to bring up, yeah, yeah. it wasn't that it wasn't saying whether it's your right fit. But this argument, when is he? When did he write his book? Is it 1886? The first one. It, it, it's 1880 something. Anyway, I think it might be six. The first edition. This argument here is an argument that comes straight out of Millerite history. William Miller and and his associates they were dealing with this 40 years before this argument even comes up. So I'm, I'm putting 1886 is the first time I think the book is published, but the appendix doesn't, isn't in that first series of books. I don't know when, it, when the first time the append appendix note's gonna be in there. But minimum 40 years afterwards, they're, they're, they're having the same arguments. So we, again, with Conradi, his view of the daily isn't new. He's just picking up from Protestantism, and the Millerites were battling with that issue of what the daily is as they were with the 2520, and this argument is not new, it's a f at least a 50 year old argument by the time it's been put into Uriah Smith's book. And today it's still an argument. Yep. And he's still an argument, yeah, they're still, they're still pretty, it's unbelievable. It's, a, it's unbelievable. Uh, I don't know why we got onto that, but... Um, so, the grammar. I think I'm about done on the grammar. When you go into the Hebrew, they both work out just right. The reason why these subtle... Oh, I don't remember. Because the, the reason why the King James translators are subtly changing this is because they want to imprint upon this verse this whole imagery of the sanctuary service. Now, we want to do that as well. And hopefully we're going to show that the way they approach it is totally wrong. And the way we approach it is totally right. Hopefully. And it's going to be based upon this thing. Who is the priest in this, in this verse? Christ. Christ is the priest. And so we want to demonstrate that Christ is not the priest. That Christ is not the priest in this verse. In fact, the priest isn't even brought to view in this verse. Sorry? No, we don't see a priest. But what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to bring other verses to bear upon this, see this sanctuary imagery that's brought to view, and then we're going to invent a priest out of all of that. And we're going to see a priest doing a work. And the priest that we... Anyway, we'll get to that um, in that story. Do you know sometimes when... when you, you know when you pick something up and you learn something? There's this, there's this phrase in the English. It says, I've forgotten more things than I've learned. <laughs> um, and I feel like that with, that, with Daniel chapter 8. When I first started looking at Daniel chapter 8, these four verses, 9 to 12, 
I, could, I saw so many things in these verses and one of the things that you can see is the chiastic structure not only with the gender oscillation, you can see the gender oscillation, that's clear, that's the chiastic structure, straight but you can also see in the rise and fall of these powers a really nice chiastic structure and I've forgotten it so the reason I mention that is verse 11 is teaching you something about the relationship between pagan Rome and papal Rome and the first part of the, and the reason why it's important to understand that is because I think I've already said that I tend to break this verse into three segments and the first part of the, of the verse it says he magnifies himself even to the prince of the host that's a, that's a discrete piece of history and the Lord is trying to teach us something there in, in, in this part of the verse of what pagan Rome does to Christ and, and it's doing that in a specific sequence for a specific purpose and then there's this complete switch that occurs in the next part of the verse once it's made that statement and unless you can see this chiastic pattern it all seems a bit abstract so because I've forgotten the reason and the logic that I had years ago when I was looking at this I fully appreciate that what I'm saying sounds a bit abstract that it's that I want to get this verse and I want to make it 8a, b and c and I'm just going to say this is history 1 two and three and it's almost just like I'm arbitrarily saying that that's what this history is but I'm not I've been, I've been praying for a, good, for a while since I've been here that I might remember what logic I use and the problem is none of that stuff was ever recorded Did you want like uh, 11, A, B and C? That, that, that's a lot better <laughs> yeah 11 A, B and C. Good. So there's a chiastic structure within this verse you're saying? And not just with, I'm not saying just within this verse. When you go to verse 9, 10, 11 and 12, this is masculine, feminine, masculine and feminine. That's one chiastic structure, but you can, you can strip out the information and the logic will go something like this. When you see what's happening here, this is the rise of pagan Rome. And this rise of pagan Rome is teaching us something, how it rises. But the first part of this verse here, it's, always, it's also doing this rising as well. So this is the rise of pagan Rome, and so is this. But this exaltation is a different type of exaltation to this exaltation. There's two types of exaltation. And as soon as he identifies this exaltation, then it suddenly switches because of having exalted itself and done everything that it's about, that it can and will do, it now switches to see the rest of the verse. This is going to talk about the transfer from pagan Rome to papal Rome or paganism to papalism. And when you see what's happening in verse 10 and verse, and verse 12, I'm doing a really bad job of this, I, I pr fully appreciate this, but you can see that there's, a, there's another chiastic structure in these four verses. But I'm not trying to identify what it is because I can't remember how, it, how I did it. The chiastic structure is the beginning is the same as the end. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's the only way of... No. I'm, oh. I'm going to say, okay, maybe, maybe I'm technically wrong. I'm going to fall back on fractals. Self-similar fractals and non-self-similar fractals. I think chiastic structures aren't just beginning and the end. I, th I, I, I might be, it might be a different phrase, but I'm saying if it's masculine, feminine, there's a pattern here. Maybe I'll just use the word pattern. There's patterns in these verses beyond the gender oscillation. There's patterns about how this nation rises and falls and what it does when they rise and fall. So that's what verse 11 is teaching us. It's teaching us there's this exaltation to Christ and then as soon as it's going to deal, finish doing that it's going to tell you how it's going to now come off the scene and what's going to happen is it's going to be switch over from paganism to papalism so for those of you who are, in, who are interested and keen looking at patterns there's a pattern in these four verses that I think have got some beautiful symmetry about them and I can't remember what it was, and it's, it, I find it frustrating. Yes. 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 Yes.
Short question. History one, you said, is the exaltation against Christ. Yes. History two. So history. So we're we, so we, we, we're we're going to plough through history two and three because we haven't got there yet. Okay. Um, the reason why I'm, I'm mentioning that is because when we get to the second history, we've got this hymn. Sorry, Brother Marco, you said something. I didn't hear what you said, sorry. I just said next trimester. Next trimester? Oh, yes, good idea. You, might, you and I might not be here next trimester. So we'd have to watch it on video or something. I don't know how that's going to work. Okay. Um, so there we've got a him, and there we've got a his. And we're identifying both of those as the he of this part, pagan Rome. So once we, once we establish this first part and then we see the connection with this, gr with this rules of grammar that we've just used, now we can identify who the him and the his are. And so once we've done that, we can go into these two parts of the verse and we can start understanding what those parts of the verse mean and then we want to apply some history to those two verses. And that brings us to the phrase, take away. So here's the phrase, take away. Now the reason why this is interesting, one of the reasons why it's interesting to me, is we read from Apollos Hale's work, the memoirs of William Miller, this is, the coding is 1843, APH, TSAM, page 66. 1843, APH, the Second Advent Movement, page 66. We've read this before, so I'm not going to read it, but all I want to point out, William Miller says, I could find no other case in which it was found, this is the daily, but in Daniel. Then I looked at those words which stood in connection with it. And then he lists three, three phrases from, some Bible, from verses in the book of Daniel. And he doesn't give the, the, the verse references. But if you go into it, his quoting, is from, from what my reading of this is, he's quoting from 811, 1131 and 1211. He, he quotes partially from all of these three verses when he talks about the daily. That's what I think. And if that's correct, what you know straight away if, he, if he's doing that, because he's going to go from here, he, where's he going to go to? 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2. We understand the reason and the logic behind that. Yeah? Because he says, I couldn't find the word daily anywhere, so what does he say he does? He says he... Sorry? Yeah, he says, I look for the words that are in connection with that word. So he picks up the phrase, take away, and then he's going to go to 2 Thessalonians. So we, one thing we know about proof texting is that you don't have to pick up the word. You can pick up the words that are associated with it. That's something that we should think about and explain when we're teaching... Uh, proof text in a line upon line to people that you don't have to necessarily pick up the word itself. And the other thing you need, to, you, 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 we should explain, is the exact phrase that's used, take away, isn't exactly the same in either, each of these three verses, for one thing. It's a slightly different phrase. And you don't have to have phrase for phrase matching. That's the other thing that we noticed, if you remember. So they're the two things. So the reason why this is interesting is in 2 Thessalonians, what, what's the gist of 2 Thessalonians saying? What's it saying? After what? After he's taken See. away. So, oh. pagan Rome must be taken out of the way. So, if, you know, if we, if we were, I don't know, some kind of gangster and I said, take him out of the way. Now, what would that mean? Kill him. Move him out of the way, you know. Silence him. So we understand what that taking away in Second Thessalonians means. It means to do away with somebody. So as soon as, if William Miller is quoting these three verses and he's taking you to Second Thessalonians to tell you that take away, I'm going to just use the, I'm just going to use the word kill. 
maybe that's not a good word to use, but, but it, you get the concept. It means to destroy one power and replace it with another. What you know is that, hopefully, most of us have an idea of it, but we're, we're going into a bit more detail now, is that takeaway in this verse is different to takeaway in these two verses. Do we already know, do all of us already know that? That it's, the takeaway is different. No? Okay, because we, we do, but, but maybe I've tricked you. This is room, and this is sir. Yeah, so you know that, Brother Johnson, yeah? Yes. Yeah, it, when I say it, 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 you, you didn't un, it doesn't click straight away. So this is room and this is sir, but it's takeaway in all three verses. And these mean totally different things. But when William Miller's looking at it, he's quoting all three of these, and he's going to go to 2 Thessalonians, take away and kill. So you know that he doesn't see that there's a subtle difference between this takeaway and these. He doesn't have that visibility because he's using crudence concordance and he doesn't know what those words mean. Sort of Does it affect his conclusion? Yeah. No, he comes to the right conclusion. Okay. He comes to the right conclusion. But I want to, us to realise as much as we can mm -hmm. about both his strengths and the weaknesses in his arguments and the strengths and weaknesses in our arguments so that whenever we're confronted with somebody that we have integrity and we have intellectual honesty about what has happened and what's happening to us and where, where we stand in respect to these things. I would advise you, go to this passage, three, see the three quotes that he has for the daily and confirm for yourselves whether or not I'm actually teaching you the correct three verses, whether you agree with that or not, because I might be wrong on that. He may, he may only have the two, for instance, or, and he may be totally correct, but that was, that's my reading of it. Um, that there's these, he's picking up these three verses and, and we understand today that there's this subtle difference. So, whatever verse 8 is teaching, it must be teaching something different than verse 31 and verse 11. That's the first point we want to understand. Because now we look, we've done the grammar, now we're looking at take away. The grammar has brought us to part B. The grammar has put us to, put us to part B, and the hymn we can now identify as pagan Rome. And once you do that, now you have to deal with what take away means. Just Part A of his, but in part history. A no. Sorry, this yeah, I've changed all this. This this was history one, two, and three. Then I rubbed it out. Uh, um, let me just put. Let me change this now to exalt. Okay. That's the beauty of having a whiteboard. You can just yeah, yeah. add things on, and when you do it on paper, it's it's difficult. So we run out of time. Did we run out of time? I don't know. Yeah, Sorry, Brother Chris. No, I'm not saying that. <laughs> this is a morning I'm just saying the truth. But I'm not saying stop. Uh, what, time, the question and what, what time do you need to... I can prolong. Okay. Prolong. You tell us when we need to stop. Just go on. Um, so, we're looking at the word take away, and we've got to rule number four, and we've now identified who the hymn is. It's, it's brought us to the second phase. So now we're going to be saying this. Let me... I'll rub that off in a minute. From pagan Rome... The daily sacrifice is taken away. Just want to add, do I want to add something? No, it's all right, I won't. So, we're going to cross sacrifice out because it shouldn't be there. And then we're going to change the daily to capital because now it's naming something. So from pagan Rome, the daily is taken away. And we're going to start looking at this, what this takeaway means. This is history too. This is history too. 
First thing we want to see is what the word daily means. So what, 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 what words do we want to use for daily? What does daily mean? Continual. Continual. So from pagan Rome, the continual is taken away. So just that sentence, what, what is that sentence telling you if we just forget the takeaway bit? From pagan Rome, the continual. Okay, well, okay, if I say from pagan Rome, the, the continual is taken away, what's that telling you then? If I said from Paul, the continual is taken away, the, so we've got ownership here. Mm -hmm. so that's what, I guess that's what I wanted to say. It's, it, it, it's maybe I can't ask the question without giving you the answer. This, this verse is talking about ownership. So, pagan Rome owns the continual. And it's going to be taken from him. Can we see that just in the plain English? Yeah, I think that's straight. If you know that, then you know that the continual and pagan Rome are not the same thing. They're two separate things. They're, yeah? Because he owns, he owns this, and it's going to be taken from him. Does that make sense? <coughs> Sister Tiffany, you're smiling. So why are you smiling? So you're not understanding, or you just think he's I'm not crazy? But I think it's, I think it's because I already have a preconceived idea that daily is the daily desolation, and without the desolation and just the continual, I'm just like it makes no sense the sentence. Anyways, if you go on, I'm sure. I, I'm sure you may still not get it, even as I go through the sentence. This is why I've tried to labour on these things because. Each verse is teaching something unique about this whole struggle, this whole relationship between the daily desolation and the papal desolation. But in, in this verse, I don't think you can construct. It's not, you're saying, in this verse you're saying it's not the daily desolation, that's what you're saying, right? I'm saying, and that's I'm saying, just read that sentence first. Is that sentence a fair translation, actually I'm not even translating, I'm interpreting now. Is this a fair interpretation of the King James translation? Yeah. yeah? So if I asked you, that's why, I want to, that's why I'm asking you, it's not a leading question, I'm asking you, what does this sentence mean? To me it means ownership. Ownership of what? He owns this. So I'll change this. Does he have to? I, I, I'm asking, I'm saying, think about it. You construct this sentence to say something that I'm not saying. Because I'm saying this says this. From Paul, the book is taken away. So it doesn't mean necessarily, though, that Paul has ownership of the book, but he takes it away. Who takes it, could it be away? It somebody else's. Paul. Paul takes it away. Mm. That verse doesn't say Paul takes it away. From Paul. Okay, I'm... This is, just straight, this is just straight English. If you stick with this sentence here. Okay. <laughs> oh, I see. Okay, so the book is taken away from Paul. The, I could, yeah, we could rewrite that. Okay. The book, the book is, is taken away from Paul. It says this, it's the same thing. Okay. So the daily is taken away then from... Rome? Yeah. Oh, okay, that makes the sense. The daily's okay, taken now. away. Okay. And so if it's taken away from it, that book must have been in the possession of Paul. Okay. The continual must have been in possession. And if it's in possession of him, they can't be the same thing. Right. So do you want to say that after 508 you don't call the pagan Rome any longer pagan Rome because the daily is paganism, you take away the pagan, now you call it papal Rome? No, I don't want to 
say 508 yep. anywhere yet. <laughs> yeah, okay, but this is this is going on in my mind yeah, because well, no, we all know what the conclusion is. Yeah. <laughs> What's the conclusion? I don't know. What yeah, I, I would say if if, if, if the if the pagan Rome and the daily is something different. Yeah. But we know the daily is paganism, and we have in the word pagan Rome. You take away the. You want, you want to change that to paganism? Yeah, we know that the daily is paganism. <laughs> Okay. Maybe I, I do not He's understand sure something, but as far things. as I know that the daily is paganism. <laughs> I think our preconceived no. ideas have confused. I'm not, I'm not trying to I'm not try yeah, let me say I'm, not try I'm, I'm just listening. Okay. listening I'm not trying to disturb the foundation that this movement and William Miller had that the daily is not paganism. I'm not trying to say it's not pagan. No. The daily is paganism. But I'm saying, when you read the verses, it teaches you a lot more than you just by, get by just saying it's paganism. The example that, this is why we went through the easy verses to, to the harder one. And now we're doing the coup d'etat because people are saying, he's shaking something up, he's looking dangerous. But I'm saying, we did it before because in verse 12, what's the daily in verse 12? It's not paganism. It's paganism. No, it's not. Verse 12, verse 12, the daily, it's not paganism. And a host was given him against the daily. At least my reading of this verse isn't. And so I'll, if you check back in your notes, you'll know that that daily is not paganism. Okay, we'll it's the Visigoths. Yeah, okay. It's the, so we, we, we should, we can, if it's good, we should rub out that word daily and put Visigoths there. Now Visigoths, to me, doesn't sound like paganism. They're, I'm not saying they're not pagan people or whatever, but it's not paganism. It's a real life story, a history, a battle that you can put into that thing. That's 508. 508. So I'm saying when we come to here, yeah, at one level we can talk about this paganism, but it, it, I don't think it's going to help us to identify what's going on in the verse. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is this. This verse is teaching us about ownership. This power owns this entity. That's the first thing that I want us to see. And if he owns it, you know the book is not Paul. And Paul isn't the book. So the daily isn't pagan Rome and pagan Rome isn't the daily. Mm -hmm. They're not the same thing. They're two separate things. So that's one thing that we can identify here. The second thing we can identify is when we're going if we start bringing history into this, we know that pagan Rome hasn't existed forever. Because if you go on here, you've seen all these kingdoms that are before it, and here's pagan Rome. So you've got a lot of history before. And the chapter teaches you that because it goes from Medo-Persia to Greece and then pagan Rome. So you know that if we did a timeline like this, from the start to the end, pagan Rome is here. So this is pagan Rome right here. And we're picking up a time in this history, I don't know where it is, say we're picking up here. When you pick up the verse here, I'm saying this is verse 11, what do we know about pagan Rome at, ver when, at the time period, at, when you just take a snapshot of this history, this timeline, part B, what do we know? We know that pagan Rome has ownership of what? Of the daily. He, has, oh, he, owns, the da he owns the daily. And now it's going to be taken from him. But what's the definition of daily? Continual. So if this is the history of pagan Rome, What's the history of the daily? Much longer. We're going to go from start to end. This is the daily. So that teaches us also that this daily was in existence before pagan Rome ever, was ever born. So they, they, again, they're not the same thing. They're, there's differences. So the other thing it's teaching us is not only ownership, but the concept of pre-existence for, for daily. the pre-existence of the daily but that's not something you get out of this verse alone right? 
I'm saying, you no, know, you can go to other, but you can get straight out of the verse. This verse, the, out of, just out of the, uh, everything I'm saying now is straight out of the verse. I'm not going to any other verse. What I'm doing is, I'm saying, we'll read the sentence like this, from Paul, or the book is taken away from Paul, so they're two separate people, he owns the book. The second thing I'm saying is the word daily means continual, which means forever. And so, you know that pagan Rome hasn't lived, existed forever, but the daily has, by its very name. So there's a pre-existence of the daily, and there's a limited life of, of, of pagan Rome. So what's the daily then, if it's longer than pagan Rome? So that's what we want to get to. That's what, we, that's what we want to try and get. But there's another thing that we can understand about this as well. This is going to be a problem that Sister Tiffany may wrestle with, because Sister Tiffany wants to do this. 2520. 2260s. This is what? I'm going to call it the daily, because that's what she wants to call it, yeah? The daily desolation, and she wants to call this papal desolation. Yeah? But if we come here... And we've, we can identify that this is the continual, and the definition of continual, as Brother Jonathan said, it goes like this. It has no beginning, and it has no end. So, here, we're going to mark the end of pagan Rome. And what date would we want to mark here? According to this. It's not 508. 538. This is 538, where you're going to switch from pagan to papal. But look what Brother Jonathan said. The daily didn't stop. The daily just carried on nicely all the way through that. Because if you want to make the daily, the daily desolation, it would have had to stop. Because then you would have had to go to the papal desolation. But the very definition of the word mitigates against that. You can't just say it's it's going to stop here because you're going to go to papal. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. so no. like it doesn't ever end. I this, is, get it. this is why we say in 508 to 538 that daily paganism gets another form of, of itself. It becomes uh, Catholicism. This is how I explained okay, so it always in the past. So, okay, if you're going to... Before we... Let me just do that and then we're going to come back to Sister Alice because she doesn't even get what we're doing. So I want, to, I want to make sure that she gets that. If you're going to do that, then you're saying this isn't real. You're saying this isn't really papal desolation. This is some kind of coded pagan desolation. Undercover pagan desolation. I would say this is still paganism but in a form of Christianity. Undercover, yeah. 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 I'm saying I don't, look, I, don't, I don't think that's correct. The reason why, the reason why I don't think it's correct is, okay, if we're going to take Hislop's two Babylons, you're going, to, you're going to get that book and you're going to show me all the pictures in the book, pick out verses and you're going to say, there it is, Babylon paganism wore fish hats. Papacy wears fish hats, so it must be paganism all dressed up. So that's the argument that you've got. So, but my argument is this, this is a real life church. This is a, this is a proper church. It's not a pretend church. Because if it was a pretend church, we wouldn't be able to develop the argument that we have about Daniel 2. We wouldn't be able to, uh, to develop the argument that it must be a church that's in transgression. Because the only definition of a church in transgression, or anybody in transgression, is adultery. It's all about adultery. And to commit adultery, you must be married to somebody, and this church is married to Christ. And therefore, if it's married to Christ, it must be, by definition, a church and not paganism. But so, Wouldn't you say then, then, once in time, the Catholic Church was a pure church? No. <laughs> no, I don't want to say that either. Because <laughs> that's going to cause... No, I don't want to say that either. <laughs> How do you marry that with the passage which, which says that... Um, I'm not, I'm not disagreeing. They wear fish hats. I'm not arguing. I agree with that. I understand that. But you have just a 
certain level deeper maybe there's certain levels and i don't i maybe we could say deeper but, I, but when we say deeper it implies this that brother jonathan's got a shallow view of, of prophecy and i've got a deep view of prophecy and i don't want to so i don't want to say i just want to say a different way of looking at it another line another way because if i say deeper then it, then it implies some kind of superiority between brethren and, and i don't like that kind of concept you mentioned that. that we should use the rules more liberally <laughs> yes! We <laughs> use the rules liberally. Historically. So you see, what, so you see what, what the, what, why I've got that problem about when you take it? Because here, if we're going to use the definition of continual, we've gone, we're, we've gone into papalism, and this is where you're going to get this concept that maybe it's just paganism dressed up in Christian clothes. And I'm not trying to deny that that's not the true, because that, that is true. And you're, that's the Spirit of Prophecy quote you, you, you're telling, showing us. Yeah. I think it's the Spirit of Prophecy quote, great controversy, I think. Um, so if it's teaching us to pre-existence, then this isn't the right way, of, I don't think this is the right way of saying it. I'm going to say post-existence. I think post-existence may, may be a word, I don't know, uh, of the daily. So what, do I, what I mean is this. The daily was here, and the daily is here, and the daily is there. It's, it's all the way through. And here we're just dealing with this, with this slight bit of history there. Go ahead. Is it because it's room in verse 11? Is what because it, it's room? In that it... It is after. No, I'm not even. I'm, we haven't even looked at room yet. All the all this logic I've done here is, first of all, the, the 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 way this verse is structured, and I'm picking up one word. I'm picking up this word here. I mean, I, that's why I said if I said ignore that the first part of the verse and everybody's sentence, everybody said it's not a sentence, so we can't do it. What I meant to say is ignore that part of the sentence and just say from pagan Rome the daily. And if you, if, you, if you don't ignore that bit of it, okay. you can see you've got ownership there, because mm -hmm. it's from him, something's happened. Then, from the word study, you can see that it's got pre-existence, that's the pre-existence bit. Mm -hmm. And then there's post-existence, because it's, it's going to happen, it's going to go afterwards. So you've got pre-existence, post-existence, and, and it, it obviously owns it in, the, in this time. So, now I want to start inferring something. Everything I've said, I think, is, is I'm not inferring anything. You just get straight out the words, and it's it's provable, and you can it's demonstrable, and you can you can defend that. Now I want to make some assumptions. But before we make that, where have I lost you, Sister Allison? I don't know. Just keep going. I keep going. You think it's gonna the hole gets deeper? I'll, uh, I don't. I I don't know. Um. Well. Okay, hang on. Um, Daniel 8.12, the daily is the discos. Yes. Daniel 8.11, the daily is taken away, that's pagan Rome. So we're working on Daniel 8.11 right now. Stop, you just said, Daniel 8.11. Wait, yeah, is, it, is the daily taken away is pagan Rome. No, I, I, that's what I'm not saying it is. What? We're, we're, you know when we were doing verse 12, halfway through the verse, I didn't tell you what, pa what, what the daily was. Didn't go to the oh, Vandals, right. Yeah, you said it was the Vandals, didn't you? Visigoths. Vis oh, Visigoths. That's what it I'm saying, when we did the study on yeah, verse 12, Visigoths. I didn't up front say this is what it is. I said, let's work through the verse. And then as we got to the point where he needed to, I said, the daily is this. And then, so I'm doing the same thing here. I'm not identifying what the daily is yet. I'm just setting us up. Yeah. Not setting you up, but I'm setting the logic up to help us to think about what the daily could be. To me, it's more important to understand the logic behind what we say than to know what we say. Okay. What's that? What are you laughing for? It's true. Is that true? That's tr isn't it more important to know why you get there than get there? Yeah. Yeah. But it doesn't make sense if the daily was pagan Rome. You'd have pagan Rome taking away, taking away pagan Rome. Yes, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. So I'm saying they're two separate things. Okay. 
So I'm saying Pagan Rome owns this thing. Right. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Paul owns the book because it's taken away from him. Then I'm showing pre-existence because it's continual. Mm -hmm. Continual means it's forever. And it's post-existence. And it continues on. It's continual. Yeah, that's so they're, they're facts. Now I'm going to make an assumption. And the assumption is this. <coughs> that Pagan Rome owns the daily here. And then before this, if this was the daily, the daily's living, the daily's writing this history, someone else owns the daily after, before this. So I'm going to look at, I'm going to call that ownership now. No, not now, I'll call it present. In the present tense, Pagan Rome's got ownership. So then I'm going to look at ownership in the past. And the future. So, do we see why I'm doing that? Mm -hmm. Because it's got past and future, and I'm saying if, it's, if there's ownership in the present, I w I'm inferring that there's going to be ownership in the past and in the future. Mm -hmm. So, if this is correct, and, and it is, if this is correct, then what we'd identify is this is a, a nation state. So there will be nation states before it that are going to have possession or ownership of the daily. And, and that would, that's I guess what we would lead, where you'd be going with the daily desolation. Because you're going to put um, Babylon, Meda, Persia, Greece, Pagan Rome, daily desolation, 1260. So if we went into this history back here, then in the, in the chapter we'd go Meda, Persia and Greece. Yeah, we go Medo Persia and Greece. So Medo Persia owned the daily, and then Greece owned the daily. Mm -hmm. And what I'm suggesting when I look at this verse is not that Medo Persia is the daily, or that Greece is the daily, or Pagan Rome is the, it's they, they had ownership of this thing. Mm -hmm. So what comes after Pagan Rome? We have Papal Rome. And so when we talk about past ownership, we'd have the Medes and, and Greece, and the future ownership would be the papacy over here. So, I'm suggesting this verse teaches an awful lot in these few words. Mm -hmm. What's been brought to view is that Whenever this, whenever this verse is in history, <coughs> pagan Rome, in the present tense, owns this continual. It's going to be taken from him and it's going to be given to the papacy. So the papacy is going to own it, but prior to pagan Rome, these nation states owned it already as well. So this daily is now being, is hopping from one to another. Yeah? Why do we start with the Persia? Because that's where it starts in the chapter. If, we're, if we want to go into the, if we want to go to seven or two, or pick up the thread of, of the twenty-five twenty, we go back to Babylon. I'm not trying to deny Babylon isn't in that. So now we're seeing that what is, what's the daily doing? If I rub that out, the daily is doing this. It's hopping from one to another. Now, I've kind of deliberately used the word hopping. Because I want to try and trigger something in your mind. If you get... Two yeah, thank you. Hoping. <laughs> I was hoping something. So, if we think of the word hopping from one to another, what, what, what is, what, where would that take you? Maybe it would take you nowhere and I'll just tell you what I, where I think it's taking us. Revelation 17. Why do you say Revelation 17? The woman sitteth upon the beast. So the woman's sitting upon a beast, but in the, in the later verses it actually says where she's sitting. Mm -hmm. On the heads. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with that, Tiffany? Yeah. yeah? Ezekiel, that's what I was thinking. What was that? Ezekiel, yeah. Okay, I'm think, I, I was thinking... Um, you, so you were thinking on the crown that was powerful. Yes. 
yeah. but there's something different. This is something different. I don't think you're going to get the crown to work on this one because you'd have too many overturnings. When you, when you start adding them up, you'd have too many. Um, because with the crowns, it stops. It, st it would stop here. And it came from Israel. Yes, because you've got, you've got one more before this and you've only got three overturns and it, st it would stop here. You, you, you end up having another one if you do that. Uh, this to me is Revelation 17. So if it's Revelation 17, then what we're beginning to infer is that this daily is what? Sorry? Revelation 17, who hops from one kingdom to another? The woman. The woman. So... So, so this is talking about maybe some kind of woman. So in our next study, because we need to come to a close, um, we'll, we'll explore a little bit more about this continual. And I, I'm not going to pick up this, this concept or this idea of it being a woman. Um, but you can definitely see that when you, when you begin to see that it... it this daily was, has ownership all the way through. So that's one thing that you can see brought to view in this verse. But the, there, there are other things that we want to talk about with respect to the daily. So when we look at it again, we're going to talk a little bit more about the daily in relationship to the taking away in verse 11. And in verse 11, this is, this is not the same as these two verses. This is room and this is sir. So we're going to have a little bit more of a look with room and sir and see the differences between them. And then take a look at this whole drop, uh, this whole um, backdrop of what Peter's used. The phrase he uses is this cultic backdrop, and what he means by that, he wants to go into the sanctuary system and see this, which is what the King James translators did, but they did it incorrectly because they want to identify in verse eleven that the priest is Jesus and we wanna, we're going to identify that the priest isn't Jesus it's someone else let's pray Heavenly Father we thank you for your loving kindness and your goodness towards us we thank you for the blessings of this Sabbath day and we ask and pray Lord that we would hear your voice speaking to us through these sacred hours that we might honour you and glorify your name please direct our thoughts and our feelings <coughs> heavenward Father, you've brought us through this week with its joys, pleasures and happiness. And during these sacred hours, may we contemplate our words, our thoughts, our actions during this past week. And if we've done anything wrong, Lord, may we spend these hours, even at the beginning of this day, Lord, so we don't ruin our Sabbath, may we repent of these things so that we may have freedom and liberty to worship you and honour you, especially before we come before you tomorrow um, to church. Lord, we thank you for these studies in the book of Daniel. We ask that you would be with us and bless us. Help us to have a clearer understanding of the work of Jesus, our high priest, as he ministers for us in the closing moments of the judgment of the living. Be with us and bless us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.